Today is December 4th, 2017, and you're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 68. Today on Human Factors Cast, we're breaking down all of your tech news from Alexa in your office, haptic feedback in virtual reality, AI super muscles, and more. We got a lot of acronyms today. Hey, Blake, do you think Draper would make us a Take Me to Human Factors Cast button for listeners? Anyway, Human Factors Cast starts right now. Let's do it. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. What's going on, everybody? How are you? There he is. Hey, Blake, how are you? I'm doing fine. How about you? I'm I'm good. I'm good. This is very this is very colloquial, ca- casual, if you a will. Nice casual show for the listeners this week. Yeah, I I think so. I, I I don't know. There's not there's there's some stuff going on. How are what's going on in Blake's world? Well, as you could tell from the show notes, my banter is absolutely empty. Whoa, so that is uh, empty. That's not good for anybody. But yeah, I mean things are good. But I have to say, I've been trying to help out with the. Uh, user experience nonprofit that I work for as a marketing director, and I decided I would take on building, rebuilding their website through WordPress. And oh my goodness, man, like setting up a local development environment has been a nightmare today. On WordPress? Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I don't just, know. I don't it's just it, like man. a usability and human factors and user experience problem all over the place. I don't really even know what to do. The directions are pretty good, but I don't know. Some of the database stuff is so tough. Like I had, I had the, I had everything up and running this morning, but of course, one small change and it all went to hell in a handbasket. I uh, yeah, I completely hear you there. I worked with WordPress for a while, and it was not my favorite time. Yeah, not my favorite time either, my man. I much prefer JavaScript <laughs> and React. But anyway, Nick, how are you? Hey, I'm good. Hey, I just want to address a couple quick administrative things. Um, In the next couple episodes, as you might imagine, uh, it is the holidays here in the States and worldwide as well. But uh, Blake and I are going to be doing some different things here just because we want to still provide you with shows, but also we want to spend time with our families and take some time off from the podcast. Don't worry, you'll still be getting your weekly dose of Human Factors Cast. And in those, we're going to kind of go over our 2017 predictions and see which ones came true, which ones didn't. We're also going to kind of predict for what we're expecting in 2018 in, in the field of human factors. And also we're going to kind of go through, uh, you know, um, a, a Reddit mailbag, if you will, and just kind of address a bunch of questions that show up on Reddit. And something I thought might be fun was uh, this listener engagement through our Slack. Now, uh, first off, welcome to Tuan Tran, who joined our Slack this week. Uh, we always like to give people new new uh, Slack members a shout out. Um Second off, so what we're going to do is we're going to ask our Slack members uh, to basically uh, talk about the user experience with their holiday gadgets or something that they get. And we'll kind of, you know, get get some feedback from those uh, listeners that are in our Slack and, and we'll talk about it on the show and, and just kind of their experience. And I think that'd be fun. Fun yeah, that'd be thing. a nice back and forth with the listeners. I'd love to share gadgets with them and learn what they are interested in for the holiday season. Yeah. Um, aside from that, man, I got to tell you, so unfortunately, uh, I was hit on the road on Friday. About. Oh, two- my goodness. How are you feeling, man? <laughs> uh, well, I got a real bad pain in my neck. I'm just kidding. I'm totally fine. The other driver is completely fine. Everyone's fine here. How are you? Um, and so <laughs> that was a Star Wars reference. Uh, so I, I just have to comment though on, so human factors is more than just interfaces, right? It's the process. And I have to say the process of dealing with, um, you know, an accident reporting it to your insurance company and talking to the other person and dealing with their insurance company and then taking it and getting body work done on the car. That's all. And a rental car. And it's just all a lot of stuff to handle. And I am, I have to say, like, even though it's a lot, like, they have streamlined this process and they've got it down to sort of a science, if you will. And, you know, I I go through AAA 
And uh, they they have one claim number basically to rule them all. And you basically, wherever you go, you just give them this claim number. I'm sure it works like this with other insurance companies. But I'm amazed that AAA will handle like all the behind the scenes stuff with talking to the right people and just, I don't know. It it's It's nice in the sense that a lot of it is taken care of uh, and, and you don't have to worry about it. Um, well, I, see, Nick, that's, I, I'm glad your experience has been like that, but actually this is something we talked about a little bit on Saturday when we saw each other for a holiday party, but my like customer experience with a similar incident, in this case, my car got totaled with my auto insurance company. I had such a horrible experience with just the, the customer processes going through, like having a claim number, but having to talk to different people every time. So I'm glad that you had a totally different experience in your instance, because I definitely found myself feeling super uncomfortable and really unclear what was going on throughout the entire process. Yeah. You know, I, I wonder if it's just the insurance company. Who do you have? Oh, I, I don't say it on the show. If, yeah, if I don't want to like hate on anybody okay, yeah, on don't, the show. But yeah, don't I, mean, call I think that's probably just a difference between companies. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's probably right. And honestly, man, like they have just made this so smooth. Um, and uh, it, it makes it worth, you know, paying that premium <laughs> for uh, for good, good car insurance. But man, like I got to say, it's just been I've been really impressed uh, despite, you know, still having to talk to a variety of people. It's only been like three or four different people instead of um, I'm sure it could be a lot more. Uh, there's something else on the show notes that I cannot talk about. Uh, <laughs> that, oh my goodness. It found it. It can't talk about it. I was hoping you could cause it sounds awesome. But Well, well you know, what? I'll, I'll, I'll hold that until Monday uh, if, until next Monday. Cause okay. Just to give our listeners a preview, there is this thing on the ninth that I can't quite talk about yet. Um, I helped brainstorm a little bit on some ideas i'll just give you a little taste it's uh it's it's a little vr thing uh in la that has to do with a franchise that i'm i'm i like so okay i probably said too much but that's okay if you're google savvy you can probably figure it out but anyway i'll talk more about that next week all right so you got no banter i bantered all over the place i think it's time that we get into human factors news what do you say Ah, uh, let's get into it, man. Okay, so this is the part of the show all about Human Factors news. This is where we talk about everything related to Human Factors. Uh, this could be anything from medical, transportation, psychology, AI, VR, automation, whatever it is, as long as it relates. I think we got a little bit of everything in there this week. As long as it relates to the field of Human Factors. Blake, what do we got up first this week? Yeah, Nick, you're definitely right. We got all sorts of everything this week. First up, we're talking spacesuits. So definitely the greatest fear for many astronauts is getting lost or disoriented during an untethered spacewalk. So how, how are they going to get back to safety with no direction, little help, and most likely a limited supply of oxygen? Well, researchers at Draper may have a solution. They recently applied for a patent on a self-return feature in spacesuits that would automatically navigate back to the astronaut's home ship. The spacefarer in panic could just slap a button and know that they were on their way back to the airlock. Draper is, in fact, hoping that this autonomous system would trigger thrusters all on its own, but it's also possible that the astronaut may have to manually navigate themselves using an in-visor display and sensory cues to guide them back to the home ship. Now, Again, Nick, we talk a lot about some seriously sci-fi sounding stuff on this show, but I feel like I can't believe this hasn't been around for longer than this, especially since we've like had so much with space travel across different countries over the last few decades. I am also just as shocked as you are about this because I like it, it just seems like something that should be uh, what mandatory for <laughs> For a system like this where you could potentially get lost and and drift out into space? Like, I don't know. That's terrifying to me. If you've ever seen gravity or uh, the Martian in particular really uh, induces those feels of isolation. And, um, you know, we wouldn't even have half of the Martian if, if they had this spacesuit, you know? <laughs> Oh, yeah, I know. Just like, you know, zoom your right back. But the the crazy part of this to me, too, is I didn't think about how often people are running around untethered in space. Like, I, I thought a lot of that was much more of a sci-fi kind of dream world, right, where you see a lot of untethered spacewalks. But apparently it's real enough that these guys are developing a patent specifically to bring people back to the ship using different sensors. 
That's crazy to me. So the idea is that the, this this automated system would then take over their jet propulsion, which would bring them back, uh, and and what just in within reach of the space station, so that way they can grab onto it. Because I mean, if you're stricken with panic, or worse, if you are knocked unconscious due to space debris, how are you going to get back in this thing? And I guess it could kind of keep you near it, but I don't know. I still see some issues with it. But man, is this is this an improvement? Yeah, that's a really good point too, Nick. I mean, what what do you do then in the case of like if somebody gets hit by space debris and they're kind of out cold floating in space? Because the like the article says, this is patents more for like a button that you slap on your suit that'll kind of like start the process, whether it's manual or it's automatic. So that's that's a really good point. It sounds like people in the cockpit would still need to be able to activate that in kind of like really dire situations. You know what? Now that I'm thinking about it, space debris is probably traveling way too fast, even knock you out i mean you'd probably be dead if you got hit by any substantial space degree you know like yeah uh, yeah well that's that's a whole different ball game you're probably right yeah that's that's well but still i'm okay so back on this thing this this automated system it's just one more example of how automation is helping us uh in our everyday spacefaring lives Oh, yeah. And it's it's kind of a really tough problem, right? Because you can't use something like GPS that we've come to come to be so reliant upon, like on Earth, right? Because now you're just having to basically use sensors to track motion and position of your stationary object, which in this case is basically your spacecraft. Right. Uh, So it's just a whole different, you know, set of problems to deal with when you're talking about putting humans in space untethered on their own. I don't know. It's it's incredible that it's taken this long to even for a patent to come out for this. But I mean, NASA's backing these guys doing it, so it must be must be pretty good patent wise. Now I'm thinking about this applied to other domains, and I'm wondering if you could um, sort of extract this idea, because I mean, nothing's going to be one to one. You're never going to have another system where you have to get back to um, home base using jet propulsion in a zero g environment. But I can totally see, so there's a lot, there's an example of, uh, let's say, um, divers who will get lost in caves, right, and don't know which direction is up uh, because they're, you know, in these, yeah, deep sea divers. Oh, you you even have it here in, in the notes. I'm just talking, like, off the top of my head. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were, like, ghosting around the notes. Just no, <laughs> no, 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 I didn't even see those there. Okay, yeah. Oh, so great. whether it's a deep sea diver or firefighter in the middle of a burning building, yeah, you're right. Th- yeah, there's these examples where you do have sort of these um, these situations where you can become disoriented, and systems could potentially orient you uh, to some sort of anchor, right? I think I think that is one way that we can extract this into um, a more uh, everyday use or or a more practical use here on Earth. Oh, most definitely. It, it, of course, leave it to me to like want to take it one step further. But when I was thinking about like the deep sea diver version and the firefighter, like of course from the example that they give, this much more lends itself to that manual system. So these bo- both of these uh, types of people, so a diver with a mask and a firefighter with a respirator on, would be able to have some kind of you know heads up display to give you more of that orienting guide out of the building or out of the cave. What if? What if? And I don't think it's that far off because we've talked a lot about different exoskeleton suits. If, especially in the case of a firefighter, let's say somebody that maybe passed out, could an exoskeleton in coordination with kind of an AI system that it's talking about or this autonomous system help move a body out of a burning building by understanding the mapping of the place? Um, And I I feel like something similar could be used for the deep sea diver, uh, helping navigate them out of the actual port or out of the cave that they're in just kind of using some of the location data because you'd have a little bit more availability to either sensors or gps depending on how far down you are so i feel like this could really get abstracted as like machine learning and everything gets a lot more far gets further along yeah i like the way you're thinking i like the way you're thinking uh i got nothing else on this one you you want to move to the next Let's move to the next one because this this is a uh, kind of a different take on a lot of what we've seen for self-driving cars and legislation. Yeah, it's interesting for sure. 
Yeah, all right. So California regulators shot down what appeared to have been a very ill-advised plan to let self-driving car manufacturers dodge liability for crashes if cars weren't maintained to industry-written specifications. No such maintenance requirements exist for standard human-driven vehicles, and the Department of Motor Vehicles was only considering the proposal after it, suge- after it was suggested by General Motors. If the rule had been actually adopted, scenarios could have included automakers dodging responsibility for major car crashes because of things like slightly underfilled tires or failing to meet oil change schedules. So a lot of what we've talked about over the past, I don't know, a few months, it feels like, is is all the legislation going towards getting self-driving cars on the road so they can be tested. But this is actually a case where I think it, it seems like, at least in California, California's DMV, they've kind of caught some of the manufacturers and now are holding them to a higher standard uh, kind of getting at what happens when a crash occurs with an autonomous vehicle and who's going to be in for the liability of it. Yeah, I mean, so this this uh, idea is something that we've talked about on the show a couple times before. Who's at fault when an autonomous vehicle crashes, right? Is it the programming behind it, or is it is it the company, is it the software company that has programmed it? Like, there's a lot of unanswered questions, right? And so I think this is just one more example of uh i always say that i I think it it's a good step towards holding these people who are creating these algorithms who are maintaining these devices uh and basically saying no you're the one who's responsible for this um and it's it's a it's an important step with a lot of implications for the future right i mean if california is backing down on this and saying no 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 no, you are at fault here if anything goes wrong you're going to sort of see a higher level of regulation as it comes to these autonomous vehicles and a and a more thorough thoroughly thought through process for how these vehicles get out there and what the process is for um you know riders in these autonomous vehicles uh and so so i don't know i just think it has huge implications and that's why i pulled the story but i i'm i'm I don't know how I feel about it, honestly. Yeah, I've, I've kind of got like a weird two-way street about this one, and I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit. Um, for me, it's it's kind of a strange place, but I, I definitely think it needs to be talked about. But really, what it, it's that interaction between, okay, when is your driving, your autonomous vehicle company at fault versus when's the human at fault here. And what I'm seeing is there was some discrepancy between, you know, kind of regular car maintenance that you have to upkeep nowadays that we definitely do manually, like uh, inflating your tires, making sure that it gets oil changes and it maybe in the future software upgrades consistently. And where's that blame going to fall? Or does that need to be part of kind of the operating system when they drop out these autonomous cars do manufacturers like general motors need to be making sure that as part of like the safety regulations that all these normal maintenance things are being taken care of along with the car and i i I think there's a good argument for yes but uh, at the current time if you think about it in manual cars a lot of that would be on the human right so if we got an accident and having to be you know, judge that it was because your tires were uninflated or your car caught on fire because your oil was way low, something something strange like that. I mean, nowadays we would blame that on the human, not the manufacturer, because there's certain benchmarks that they have to reach. Right. But it's it's likely that our our kind of I don't I don't know how to describe this, but maybe the schema of how we think of cars is gonna change and it, with them becoming like quote unquote autonomous, maybe we, people will start to think or adapt the idea that the car should take care of itself, or that they're yeah I I because I I seem to think I'm under the impression that with autonomous vehicles, transportation will become more on demand, and you won't own a car, and maybe you will, but there will be this this more um, sort of on demand model where you can just call a vehicle, it'll show up to your place, and um, and that'll be that. And I think, th- so So this has implications for the user if you do own an autonomous vehicle, right? When you, you it, it would almost create these, uh, these pressures for um, the consumer to go in and get updates and upgrades 
and to check whether the system is operating as intended on a regular interval. And I mean, I don't even do that with my car and I should, right? And so when you have these autonomous systems that are supposed to be operating under these assumptions that the car has a certain PSI in the wheels and, and that, you know, the, um, the oil's at a certain level and all this other stuff, when you take that out of the consumer's hands and put the responsibility into the uh, manufacturer's hands, how are you going to convince the consumer to part with their vehicle if they do own it? This is not going the route that I think it's going to go where the vehicles are on demand. But if the if the consumer does own it, you know, how, how does the manufacturer then uh, reach out to them and say, hey, it's time to come in so that we can fix this up? And then are they still at fault even when, you know, they, they come and say, hey, we need to fix up your car and they don't do it? You know, so there's there's a couple things going on here that I I still think need to be worked out, and uh, time will tell when it comes to um, use cases for this. Yeah, and I think you break some bring up some really great points in regard to this because I mean, yeah, if if you, we do end up owning our, owning our cars still at like the time when we're really getting a lot more autonomous vehicles existing, then yeah, it's it's kind of this weird place between is it the consumer's fault if they don't bring it in? Should these companies like in their heads plan on either like software updates that are automatically going to be pushed to vehicles, which I think would be a possibility, especially as things become more interconnected with like the Internet of Things and they're always being like access to Wi-Fi. But also, too, I mean, they could be they could push themselves for on demand technicians, kind of like the same model you're talking about. But if something needs to be fixed, having enough of the simple tools to take with you to show up at the person's house, fix the car kind of takes all the rely takes all the liability issues possibly off of them. So they don't have to worry about it anymore. The car has been serviced and it makes it easier for your consumer. But I, I think the more interesting point you bring up is the benefit of kind of developing these more. Or, or integrating kind of the self-driving and autonomous vehicles into just like a city structure. So with it, when it, any time that you're really looking for, you know, kind of transportation around town, it's run by some kind of some type of autonomous vehicle, like picking up multiple people at a time. And in that way, these companies, and this is super future, but these companies would always have these cars coming back at night to be serviced or when they're right. not in use, they could constantly be serviced. So it's, it's cool. It's too cool, really, paradigms for how these can fit into our our evolving lives. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I just don't know. Like, there's there's so much gray area with you know when when somebody actually owns an autonomous vehicle versus using an autonomous vehicle as a service, right? So, I, it's hard for me to fall either way on this one. I would consider the human at fault if they did not go in and regularly um, get their maintenance done. But if it is an on-demand thing, like I don't know, it, it, then then they're the the manufacturers at fault for not keeping them up to standards. There's a lot to think about there, and a lot for me to process. Yeah, I think the best thing to come out of this is now it's creating a stricter environment for manufacturers. So hopefully yeah. they'll be they'll develop cars that are safer and that'll also feel safer to the public because of these kind of regulations. So I think it, it's all good uh, or moving in a good direction. Yeah, I agree. I agree. All right. Why don't we uh, talk about our old friend? Oh, our old friend, Alexa. She's coming to a brand new place. So as we know, the user interface. (laughs) She's going to a better place in the sky. All right. So the user interface is definitely evolving. So our UIs have long been dominated by screams of all screens of all shapes and sizes. And this is now really turning into more of designing for voice operation. And while many companies are building voice interfaces, none of them are quite as dominant as Amazon's Alexa. And now Amazon has announced Alexa for Business, a new platform allowing companies to build out their own skills and integration for both practical and business use cases. So, Nick, I was when I saw this headline come into our Slack that you put in there, I kind of laughed I was like, what in the world is are they going to do with Alexa in the office? But when I read this article, this is another instance where I think this is a great place for like a, another piece of technology that when initially designed wasn't going to go in this particular environment. It was going into people's homes, people's smartphones. But I really think that this integration could be very useful. This is You Can Use Me in the Office Now. 
All right. Well, that would that didn't go over very well. <laughs> I tried to get her back on the show. I couldn't couldn't quite get it to work. All right. She's busy in the office, she's, man. She she's no so time busy in the office. Now, the, okay, so I'm of two minds on this one, like you are of two minds on other things. So <clears throat> mind one says, well, what if you work in a cubicle environment where you are sharing it, a shared space with multiple people and everyone is using this personal digital assistant let's just not let's not call it alexa let's call it anything that at google home whatever it is it's this personal artificial intelligence assistant you put this in the office everyone's talking to it it works in a in a workspace where you have your own space you can close the door um and uh you know you're not going to bother other people but i can see it getting very confusing um, where everyone is saying these wake words simultaneously in a shared space where, you know, let's say let's say you and I are working in offices back to back and I say, Alexa, set a reminder for three o'clock tomorrow at, you know, for, I, I need to go to the grocery store or whatever. And it sets a reminder on yours because yours picked up the sensitivity of my voice and set that alarm on your um, on your schedule. That's just one example. Um, I'm thinking that they can probably get around that with, you know, voice training and training it per device. But the the more practical problem is the fact that you're going to be in an office space with a bunch of people talking to people who are not there. You're going to have a bunch of people talking to themselves in their own cubicles and the noise level is just going to go up and it's going to be impossible for anyone to focus. Now, I know you wouldn't use it all the time, but, I mean, if I had Alexa in the office, I would definitely be using her for reminders all the time. I use her for reminders around the house, and it would be very easy for me to say, you know, set a reminder for this time, I need to go to this meeting. Set a reminder for this time, I need to do this. Set a reminder for that, I need to do this. Um, and I, I, I would love that. But again, it comes back to that shared space thing. I don't know, Blake, what are you thinking on this one? So, okay, I'm going to kind of go through some of the options that they were trying to, I guess, bring Alexa into the business for. And one really struck me as probably the best use anywhere. So the first focus that they have for Alexa for business was in your conference room. So working with different video and audio conferencing providers to basically just say, hey, Alexa, uh, start, start web conference. That would save so much hassle in the office. Now, of course, this is going to take a lot of integration work, but the idea is pretty solid. Execution is going to be the hard part. Right. And I think your ideas about the Alexa kind of problem inside this larger workspace, because a lot of people are working in open, open areas. That's definitely really popular right now. Not everybody has an office. And I thought it was. I thought it would be a good idea to use some of the for people to have access to some of these like echo functions, like getting the news or setting reminders, but it's going to be very confusing. My guess would be that this is this first like integration of Alexa is going to be much more of a test, but I would say that you're probably going to either get some serious vo voice training, which I know Siri is pretty, pretty good right now between like my voice, my friend's voice and like Elise's voice. They're all very different and they only react to mine. So I'm sure that Alexa is probably similar, but I, if I was to guess, you're going to see a suite of tools that are going to come out like smaller headsets that only localize to your voice so that when you say Alexa, set me a reminder, it's her in like almost kind of like an AirPods headset yeah, right, telling you that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's. Um, I can see them getting around that problem. It's just the the amount of noise in the office. It would sound like a call center. It turn your, you know, software development office into a call center, which <laughs> would just sound ridiculous. But at the same time, like I, I don't know, it could be it could be useful. I, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's more about I think to me how they're integrating it and in things like this this conferencing stuff. They've also talked about that. They're, they're somehow integrating, I guess, with Microsoft and its productivity services. So maybe not everything is so um, returning like voice. Or <laughs> if you say something to Alexa, maybe not every t in every instance she's not giving you like a verbal response. Maybe she's giving you something textual on your screen or I don't know. There could be ways around it, but I think it'll only time will tell how this really plays out. Yeah, yeah, I, mm, yeah. I would love... <laughs> the, yeah, you do bring up a good point with the with the web conference. Yeah, set that up. 
Because oh my goodness, we, yes, don't want to spend of, like all these passwords and having to turn on ten different things. Like oh just Alexa, can we start the WebEx? Just as a uh, quick little side note, have you seen um, the web conference bingo? Oh no, what is this? So web conference <laughs> bingo uh, or conference called bingo. There's a bunch of images on on online. You can go and search for this if you'd like yourself. But um, <laughs> the free space on this is. I'm sorry, I was on mute. And then <laughs> you <laughs> you got things like B B one is hi who just joined. Um, you know I two or I whatever it is. Uh, can you email that to everyone? Blank, are you there? Uh, blank, you're still sharing. <laughs> yep, that's. That's awesome. I love that somebody created that. Yeah. No, it's still loading. Hello? Hello? Can we take this offline? <laughs> I'm sorry, you cut out there. <laughs> uh, man, we would have bingo. like. Uh, yeah, really easily, right? I'm yeah. sorry I'm late. Insert lame excuses. Uh, can everyone see my screen? <laughs> <laughs> that's the one that I'm most guilty of. Yeah. It's just, can everybody see my screen? Can you see what yeah. I'm doing? <laughs> Yeah, the the let's see here. Child or animal noises. <laughs> oh, those are the funniest ever. Yeah, yeah, you've been guilty of those on the podcast before. It's okay. Oh, of course I have. Yeah. yeah. It's like live so, well, from the playground out here. So have I, man. We got the cat clinking with the 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 cat bells. Yeah, cat bells clinking. Okay. All right. Uh shall we let's see here. Are we do you have any other closing thoughts on this one? Nah, I think I think we beat this one pretty hard. <laughs> Yeah, all right. Okay. <laughs> Let's just take a minute to thank our friends over at TechCrunch and Gadget, the Next Web, IEEE Spectrum, and Gizmodo for all of our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along with those, you can uh, head on over to social media for all of our links to the original articles. We post those as we find them, and uh, they go straight to our Slack first, and then they get dispersed on our social media. So if you want the cutting-edge, up-to-date information on Human Factors News, join our Slack. Link is in the description. All right, Blake, what do we got up next? Oh, man, this is probably one of the sickest stories of the week. So as we've talked about on the show and we've seen in the news, the future of virtual reality largely depends on the ability to give people haptic feedback. And now that we can use VR headsets to transport ourselves to another world, in order to bring those experiences to life, we need systems to help recreate actual sensations. Well, HaptX is moving in exactly this direction, bringing world-class haptic feedback to VR with the haptic hapt x glove now it may look and feel like a ski glove except it has plastic clips on the fingertips <laughs> that combine to produce tactile feedback with force feedback both of these are key components of the sensation we recognize as actual touch hapt x envisions this glove will actually be used for three main purposes so employee training design and manufacturing as well as location-based entertainment Nick, I was actually really surprised that I had to stutter there, but also that this was not really going to be targeted as a consumer launch product, but more of a man, like a, a large company or corporate type of product. And I think that's a really smart move for some of this VR technology to grow. Sure. Now, the one application that you are not uh, mentioning here is the um, the haptic rig, so you can plug into the Oasis. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> No, but this is one step closer to that, right? I love this story um, because I am a huge fan of masking the senses. And uh, anytime you can mask another sense to fool yourself that you are in this alternate reality um, or this virtual environment, it is it is that much more immersive. Now, you're right. This, this, uh, this is being directed more towards the um, training and design and manufacturing, all that stuff. Um, and location-based entertainment, that one to me is really interesting because it is, uh, that to me is kind of like these experiences, like I'm going to go to in January where you have the Star Wars VR experience where it's hyper-reality and you can touch the walls and everything else and, and interact with the components in the virtual environment. So it still sounds like they're going the entertainment route, but they don't want to put these in homes probably because of the price. Um, now, no price was mentioned on this article, but... Something like this could be uh, pretty pricey, I would I would think. Oh, yeah. I could imagine the gloves being 
really, really pricey. And, it, and I think that's why at first this is going to be just releasing it out to these bigger corporations to see yeah. how it even takes. And maybe in this like location based entertainment, like you're talking about seeing how these like live VR, um, I guess like experiences and theme parks or like events play out. And maybe over time we'll see like cheaper versions to get released, maybe packaged with headsets. I, I feel like that's definitely the future of the technology as far as like in home experience. Yeah, and what, what strikes me, too, is one of the last lines of the article here. In fact, the company is still working on a full-body haptic platform. So that, to me, is really exciting as well. I mean, we have all wanted our haptic suits to jump into the virtual environment. Because, um, honestly, if I could stay in there all day, I would. <laughs> but, you know, you sit and you sit and you sit and you you become a potato, after a while and if you could keep moving while you're in the virtual environment and get that much much more immersed it'd be awesome but yeah this this full body haptic platform that they're working on um for for the same for the very same things you can introduce factory workers into dangerous situations where they can still interact with all the components and feel these virtual environments without being an actual danger uh, that's exciting to me. The fact that you can immerse yourself in these virtual environments for entertainment, that's exciting to me. Um, the fact that you can walk around and inspect something that you are designing, uh, that's exciting to me. So there's there's a lot to love here, and um, I feel like I've talked my head out off about virtual reality in the past, and this is just one more step. Yeah, exactly. I the. The part that I'm really excited about, and I always kind of nerd out when it comes to this like entraining aspect of putting VR in there, because I think it's great for the medical field. I feel like you get a lot of more immersive experience that really doesn't have that, you know, life or death cost coming with it at all. Uh, but I, again, this would be maybe later on as they develop the full body suit um, from haptic X or as time goes on, maybe if they release this to a consumer market market, but I feel like this would be a great training avenue for people that are like trying to learn specific skills, like how to do a like really good clean or jerk or different heavy lifts or learning how to learning boxing technique in your own home. I just, oh, yeah. I feel like from the fitness perspective, this has a really awesome, uh, application too because i know some vr stuff already has some pretty great like boxing material and stuff like that but adding in that haptic feedback is really just going to change how it all plays out i completely agree all right why don't we get on to our last story of the week oh yeah let's go on to the last story of the week i think we have two more do we we do. Wow, look at that. All right, our yeah, second to anyway, last story of the week. All right, so uh, playing along with some of the AI and VR kind of stuff we've got going on this week, MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory teamed up with Harvard's WIS Institute to create a super strong, affordable artificial muscle that can be used to create soft robots with superpowers, including the ability to lift up to 1,000 pounds thousand times their weight the robotic artificial muscles are inspired by origami actually and it can be constructed in as little as 10 minutes with materials available that can be acquired for you know less than uh, one american dollar the technology uses skeletons or basic structural scaffolding which are surrounded in surrounded by a sealed bag that can then change its motion by creating a vacuum within the bag itself all right dick I need your opinion on this one because as soon as I said creating superpowers with basically origami, I was kind of afraid for the safety of humans. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I put this in there because this is, yeah, this is, this has implications for how we interact with uh, robots, but also how robots interact with us. Um, and the fact that they're using AI on this thing, uh, so I, I'm unclear here. Was the AI to sort of create these designs for these muscles, or was the is the AI in uh, conjunction with the muscles to do these tasks? Yeah. So from my take on it, it's they this was working with the specific laboratory that's from computer science and AI, but this would be more added into like an artificial intelligence robot, or that's what I'm seeing. Yeah, that's I don't scary. Know that there's any like AI integrated into these muscles. Right, right, right. This is, but the robot would use AI with these muscles. 
And yeah, that's the thought, right? That it, it would use deep learning or have like a really robust machine learning database that it could, you know, learn over time and that kind of stuff. So yeah, it would be like it's I think this is like the underlying structure of I building see. maybe the first AI dependent robot. Right. Yeah. So that's that's scary. Um how do you think human robot interaction is gonna change with something like this? Uh, you know, I, uh, I I have a lot of mixed feelings about it because if, <laughs> if 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 our listeners like if you take a second and click on this article and just look at the opening screen, I'll try and describe it to you, but it it won't do any justice. It might scare you even more. Uh, so it says like origami inspired artificial mu- muscles, and there's a video, right? And now this looks like some kind of small robotic snake arm with like a uh, you know a flower type head that it might use for grabbing kind of like a hand, but just the first on first inspection, it kind of it kind of freaks me out because it's something I've never seen before, and who knows how I, how it's actually going to interact with me or the surrounding around surroundings around me. And then the first thing we hear is that it's possible for something for something like this to pick up something uh, around I think a thousand times its weight. So that means that these algorithms have to be so fine tuned that it has to know exactly what it's interacting with, so that it doesn't you know like crush a human hand if it is interacting with somebody somebody else in the on the workspace or in somebody's home so i feel like that's a heavy reliance on technology um on the on the upside that something that is this powerful and can be created for this at this cheap of a price this quickly i feel like this has a lot of implications for um how we design and build robots for you know like design and manufacturing companies or like these big arms that are putting cars together. Um, So I I feel like there's both sides of it, but as far as how this gets integrated and what kind of people it's interacting with, I'm kind of unsure of where they want to go with this. Yeah. I don't know. This, this is a really cool concept. Um, And uh, I'm just watching the video now again and it's, yeah, the, the, the applications of this are endless. And the fact that, um, you know, we are giving this much more control to robots uh, is is scary. It's scary, but it's also um, exciting because if we build systems that can, uh, you know, these advances in technology are always, um, always exciting because it's it's a new novel way to interact with things, and the uh, the whole reason I pulled this article was you you see this there's this. Uh, example about two minutes into the video where the 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 user is bending their finger and to pick up this tire using these muscles and if you're able to have that sort of control with just one finger over your environment uh the mix of humans and robots in say like the toyota factory plant or um some other area where you're going to have to have a lot of control over really heavy potentially dangerous objects to manipulate this sort of control um is necessary and it's just another it's another way to interact with it yeah most definitely i think what excites me the most about this though is that because we've talked before about a lot of times we're trying to emulate uh human physiology and we're making robots or or we see a lot of that and in this case they've kind of they've stepped away from the human model and they've They've moved something. They moved towards something that we see in the animal kingdom with like a part of an elephant's trunk, and that's kind of really how this got its its uh, its initial initial design. And now, right. like reading through parts of the article again, I could see the utility of a lot of this, especially. And I I really wouldn't have thought about this unless the article mentioned it is in space exploration, like acting as maybe the hands that could grab you to pull you into the airlock after ple- after pressing, pressing that, that button. send me home yeah. button. There we yeah. go. Bring it back. Or even they talk about how it could be used as part of a wearable exoskeleton. So again, playing into that same theme of combining these technologies together to create like right. a more cohesive and uh, you know bigger product line. So it's 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 very amazing tech. I think it's it's a uh, it's definitely just at first glance a little hard to understand where it could go. Yeah, I mean it's still exciting though. Like the the advancement of technology and and some of these new technologies that we see uh, are are super exciting and it's interesting to kind of try to stretch our minds to see how we can apply this to the field of human factors and how it's going to affect us. 
Most definitely, man. I totally agree. Okay, now let's get into our last story of the week. All right, this is just kind of a goofy, fun one. Nick, I love that you threw this in there. So we got two Google researchers that have developed a novel project that takes advantage of your your phone's front camera and a little bit of AI to spot people around you who might be peeping at your scream. And then it shames them with nothing else but a sticker. So when a person other than you is detected to be looking at your phone screen using that front-facing camera, the screen's contents are quickly hidden and replaced with a front view of what the camera can see. The peeping Tom is then highlighted with a vomit rainbow sticker, similar to the one you may have seen on Snapchat. Now, Nick, this was just kind of like a, a fun little goofy thing, but if you really think about it, there's a lot of great implications for something like this in, you know, spaces where you or dealing with different classified information. Maybe if it detects somebody else is looking at the screen, it just immediately blanks it, not without maybe the uh, vomit rainbow sticker. Sure, but you sure. Know. Yeah, we don't need the shaming, but definitely the ability to detect whether or not somebody is looking at your screen, especially in a situation like you said where you have classified information or you need privacy, uh, you're working with sensitive personal information of other people, uh, something like that along those lines. This makes total sense uh for something like that and yeah it was just a fun little project that they did but the video demo that they have uh really illustrates that you know it it can be a little disruptive for the person who is working but then they don't have to worry about the snooping person behind them yeah the only thing that i kind of worry about is the implications of that right because sometimes what if you just like kind of accidentally happenstance glance at somebody's phone now i know they've probably taken into account the actual like time of the the glance from from somebody else's two milliseconds um, yeah well that's pretty quick but that is pretty quick I, the the part that i worry about is maybe the implication of it like right like if somebody looked at your screen and then you you see who it is and who it is behind you and what what actions people take next do they kind of freak out on people do they just like kind of laugh it off because like hopefully the person that was looking at the screen saw the silly rainbow thing i just i feel like it could create maybe unnecessary conflict um, whereas it might yes. be better if the screen just blanked versus like showing the person that was looking. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know how the system would work out, but I mean, y- theoretically you would only have it on systems where privacy is an issue, um, you know, or snooping eyes is an issue, but I, you know, for personal phone use, I don't know. Like how would you react if like I was peering over your phone, looking at what you were doing? Well, see, if it was you, I would just kind of laugh because it's like it's somebody that I know and now they have a funny rainbow on their face and I just caught them looking at my phone. Right. Um, but if it, if it was somebody I didn't know, I honestly, I might have a kind of adverse reaction like, well, what are you doing looking at my phone? And it would just make me feel uncomfortable. It's almost as if like if somebody didn't see it at all, I would feel better just not knowing. But in this case, I would feel almost kind of confrontational about like, well, what? What what'd you need to look at my phone for? What was going on? I don't know. Curiosity. And of course, I it's probably going to depend on what I'm doing. Like, if, I, right. if I'm in my banking app, cool. If I'm watching some silly video from YouTube, okay, it's a different story. Right, right, right. Yeah, and I, I, I don't know. Do you find yourself glancing at other people's phones? Um, no. <laughs> I no? don't. I do. I think so. I look at other yeah. people's phones, yeah. When people are like, uh, okay, especially this one which is relevant because we went and saw, what, Thor a couple weeks ago, and uh, there was a bunch of teenagers to our right, and they were all on their phones in the movie theater. So, of course, I was curious as to what they were on. Um, But, you know, that's a very, very uh, specific use case. But, yeah, I do find myself looking at other people's phones because I'm always curious as to what their world's like. Um, But I wouldn't be offended if, you know, they shut me out. And... I don't know how I'd react if somebody confronted me and said, hey, stop looking at my phone. Well, hey, stop using it in the movie theater. <laughs> yeah. Th- see, that's like another funny one, right? Yeah. It's like you shouldn't be using it there anyway, so you should be shamed. Or I'm probably going to look at you just to stare at you. I don't know. Yeah. So, th- don't this know. is kind of a strange one, but a fun one. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, you know what? I just want to follow up a little bit from last week. Um this is normally our where we ask you Slack questions. You ask them, we ask them in the Slack. You answer them on the Slack, and we answer them on the show with the show, ask them show. Uh, but you know, we only had one response, so get in there and respond. But we did ask, you know, do you think the end of net neutrality will affect your personally, or 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 how do you think uh, the end of net neutrality will affect you personally or in your current industry? Brian McD wrote in, 
I don't have a specific human factors example, but man, is it going to be a less startup friendly. Netflix can afford to pay the fast lane speeds toll to Comcast, but the next Netflix startup won't be able to. If you work creating new things, uh, it will be way harder, uh, easier to establish monopolies than to keep them disappointed face. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I read this and I thought, well, you know what? I don't necessarily think that, that is not a human factors example i think that's totally human factors related right because you have as a practitioner you know you're supposed to make things easily accessible to your users and something like this would get in the way of um these sort of underdogs if you will the 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 new startups it would get in their way of being able to provide their service to the people and so it's your job as a human factors human factors practitioner how do you get around this um you know, it's not necessarily your problem to solve, but it is a, 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 a problem that you have to, a challenge that you have to deal with when you create this new stuff. Well, yeah, and I think, uh, thanks, Brian McD, for writing in. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I should have hopped in there and said something. But this is just an interesting way to look at this problem, because if we rely on a lot of startup companies to hop in there and push the limits of technology and we we rely on them a lot of them to get out there and try and fail and then try and learn from their their mistakes and try again and if we're putting more you know kind of things in place to make it harder to even get your startup off the ground which i'm i think there's i'm not sure of the true statistics but i've heard at least 50 percent of startups that start don't go anywhere just because can't get the product under launch, all kinds of different problems you run into. And now if you've got to figure out how to get even more funding, uh, it depending on whatever series you're going into, this is just going to make people with the entrepreneurial spirit to really push innovation. It's going to make their jobs harder to do or even just harder to accomplish their vision, especially since a lot of the technology we use is really geared towards being connected through the internet or in what we're going to see in the future here is a lot more of AI and this interconnected, you know, interconnected like hive mind type thing. And if, if we're still being controlled or slowed down by these few companies that have all the power when it comes to networks, that's just going to be very problematic to kind of push the envelope forward. Yeah. Hey, um, really kind of quick update on the, uh, the whole net neutrality issue. Uh, this is Monday, December 4th, 2017. Today. Yeah, today. Uh, the New York Attorney General is asking for the net neutrality vote to be put off, uh, and they released a fake FCC comment finding tool. There's a bunch of um, bots that posted in the FCC, and so they're they're trying to find all the fakes, weed through them um, in an attempt to sort of delay this vote. So uh, it's working. Keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> it's getting out there. Uh, why, why don't you say we get into it came from Reddit? round out this wonderful podcast tonight <laughs> let's do it okay man so this is uh the part of the show all where we search all over reddit to bring you topics that the community's talking about so any subreddit is fair game as long as it relates to human factors and encourages discussion amongst you guys the community so blake what do you want to do one two three we got time for two of them got time for two of them um, yeah. you know, man, I really wanted to get your opinions on two and three because I two feel like three. you have a unique perspective. Okay. All right. So what does a senior UXer do that entry level UXers don't can or don't do? Uh, this is from the user experience subreddit, uh, by, oh man, Ado, Adio, Adio, 4552, Adio, 4552, uh, or do they contribute equal work and differ only in years on the job? Um, so what what does a senior UXer do that an entry UXer can't do or don't do? Um, and for both of these, Nick, I kind of wanted to throw in there just because our podcast is called Human Factors Cast that I think this applies both to like senior human factors uh, engineers or scientists and also in versus entry level. So we can tackle it from both angles if you'd like. Yeah, I I, I think that's good. Uh, what I want to get your thoughts on this one before I answer this. Yeah, so I like the part, do they contribute equal work or only different in years on the job? And I'm going to say that the that's really going to mainly depend on what company you're working for. It may be that you're doing a lot of the same work, um, just do, maybe doing a lot of technical work, but you grow up in the ranks and you get paid more for doing, like as your technical work gets better and you get more responsibility. But I think what a lot of people are equate 
the senior level of anything, but in this case, let's let's call it UX. I think it's more of being able to manage smaller teams and know how how not only how but also when it's appropriate to interact with other departments if it's a company that's kind of got a little bit more of like a, a team of designers team of engineers team of developers but also then when to when to come together with those inner departments and also when it's appropriate to go and talk to your like your high level c-suite or ceo level people to bring them in on what's going on or to make changes in funding make arguments for hey we really need to do more research or we need more interaction designers right. or ui designers uh, i think that the senior uxer really helps to drive the the vision from the perspective of okay this is what our user needs are this is what our business needs are, and this is what we need as a team in order to be successful in both uh, both those lanes of development. And they really provide that that groundwork of, okay, this is how we're going to manage all the products that we have. This is how we'll interact with other teams. Here's the timelines for getting things done. That's really what I see senior UXers or senior uh, staff hackers. members yeah. having a lot more of. Yeah, yeah. I, I am 100% on board with that. I think... A lot of it does come down to the um, directorial duties of the senior person. Uh, they they are yeah they are more involved with the vision and the direction of the overall design of something or potentially the um, you know the, potentially getting involved with setting up user sessions, reaching out to uh, clients, reaching out. They are the liaison between. Um, users, the C-suite, uh, they are kind of that that central confluence where everything kind of funnels through. Um, they they are the communicator, they are the director, they are, uh, or at least they're one of the people in that role, right? There can be a couple people in that role. Now, it, like you did say, Blake, it does kind of depend on the company. It could be just a matter of experience. Someone could just be called a senior UX designer, UX human factors practitioner, whatever it is. Um, but they still do uh, fairly the same role, just with more responsibility. Uh, you know, it, it all, it all kind of depends on that company. Most definitely. And I think the only last part I would add to, like, when I think of a senior faculty member or senior UX or human factors practitioner, I really see them as also the person that not only just conveys the vision, but also works pretty hard to mentor their team to really yes. understand where their strengths and weaknesses lie and through their experience over time on different jobs, like really try and, you know, provide those good lessons learned from things that they've done or ways that people can improve to make their team the best that they can. I think that's probably one of the bigger distinctions between, you know, senior and entry. Yeah, I agree. All right, let's get into this last one here. What is the best UX or human factors career advice that you have been given? Uh, this is on the user experience subreddit by... D O D D thirteen thirty one. What's up with all these four digit names and four or <laughs> these four four and four names? <laughs> it's a bunch of bots just making it's a stuff up. Bunch of bots. All right. What do you, uh, uh, what do you think about this one, Blake? Well, so I took this as the best at career advice that you okay you've been given. Period. Sure. Um, and I I definitely struggle with this and do not always practice it. Uh, it's one of these things I try and I'm trying to constantly do but the best best career advice i've ever gotten is don't be afraid to fail and it's it's very simple but it is so hard to get it get right in practice because i think there's like a richard branson quote and i'm probably gonna or bronson quote and i'm probably gonna butcher it a little bit but basically it's like you have to you have to keep failing and the only way to be, be successful is to continue through your failures with the same enthusiasm each time like you just you can't lose momentum based off of one screw up or one mistake or one thing you didn't get right. Like every it's almost as if every experience you put yourself through, whether it's in your work or in your life, really becomes a teachable moment that you have to take this, the time to step back and learn from it. And that's really going to be how you'll ultimately be successful is understanding what what happened to either lead to your failures and how you could have improved upon it and how you can improve upon the next thing that you do. So that's, that's kind of the best career advice I've ever gotten. You know, I, when I looked at this, I kind of thought the best human factors advice, which could be career advice too. So I'm just going to say it. 
uh, and then we can talk about it. Uh, mine, we say it every show on the week. It depends, right? And the the best advice I've ever been given is everything is good for something and everything is bad for something. And really, you have to stop and think about what is good for whatever you're doing in that moment, right? Now, this could be applied to finding a job. This could be applied to um, taking constructive criticism when it comes to failing. Uh, this could be applied to a lot of things. It doesn't just have to be in human factors, but everything is good for something and everything is bad for something. Not one thing is going to be that as seen on TV kitchen appliance that's going to do everything for you. Um, so that's why we say on the show every week it depends because it truly does depend on what you're doing and what the constraints and demands of the project are. And if you pay attention to those things, you will succeed and you'll provide at least a product that's better than what you would have had if you didn't pay attention to those things. So really that's, that's kind of where I'm at. Um, the only additional thing I'd add to that is that, you know, you, you'll never be a hundred percent. You can always try to be a hundred percent, but you'll never get there. And you have to learn to find out when is good enough. Um, otherwise you'll just get down this hole of perfection that you can't ever get out of. Most definitely. I think that those are both two really important points. And I really like how you pulled the distinction about how everything is good for something and sometimes bad for others. And I, th I think that's really true for the human factors or UX field and how you apply methods to each problem. And I yeah. think each each problem and each different user set, each different business you interact with, each different environment, it all requires you to reevaluate the skills you're going to use to tackle the problem. So I I really think that's a great way to sum up some good career advice all right well why don't we make sure that uh you know we we follow those advice and uh we become senior ux and human i don't know what i'm doing this is the end of the show that's it for today everyone let us know what you guys think of the articles this week did you like them did you hate them let us know in our slack uh we're always hanging out over there you can also follow us all over social media uh head on over to the human factors cast linkedin facebook or twitter at h factors podcast we're always uh, looking to hang out with you guys over there. Check out our SoundCloud. You can also leave us a comment over there or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. Leave us a voicemail like that nice person did last week at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. You can also support us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. We always like it when you support us financially. It helps keep the show going. Uh, if you don't want to do that, if you don't have the money, it's okay. I understand. Just... Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts. That still helps us out. The Google Play Store, add us there too, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Arnsdorf, thank you for giving me all the advice that I need today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to hang out with you and talk about Human Factor stuff? Oh, man, you guys can always find me on Twitter at Don't Panic UX, and I very much encourage you to jump in the Human Factors Cast Slack, and I would love to get feedback, interact with you, answer questions, ask you questions, all up in our Slack. Thanks again for having me on the show, Nick. Yeah, well, it's it's partly your show too, man. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again, guys, for human turning into wow, the, the Human Factors. It depends. It depends. <laughs> It depends. It's the best career advice you'll ever be given. Wow, what a mess. It's a Monday. Did I hit that it depends button? Yeah, where's, where's the it depends button? <laughs> <laughs>